Okay, members, we will now move on to questions to the Minister of Education. Question six has been withdrawn, and I call Rachel Woods. Ms. Woods. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number one. I am aware that many schools have experienced high levels of absence of teaching and non-teaching staff due to a number of both COVID and non-COVID factors. In these circumstances, principals have taken the difficult decision to close some classes, class bubbles, or move to remote blended learning or avail of exceptional closure days. These actions have been necessary in order to maintain the safety of both pupils and staff alike and, importantly, have been taken in light of the extant public health guidance. The Education Authority has established an emergency resourcing team to support principals in addressing staffing pressures and provide support where required. This team has also reviewed the Northern Ireland Substitute Teacher Register, NISTER, asking teachers to identify an interest and or experience of working with children with SEN or complex needs. They have also provided updated lists to priority schools of NIST or teachers who are available to work and have indicated a willingness to travel within the specific geographical area. Officials continue to meet regularly with the Special School Strategic Leadership Group to ensure that issues and pressures faced by special schools are considered and addressed as they emerge, ensuring that all schools remain open to provide teaching and learning for children, young people and their families is my key priority and I have asked officials to keep me regularly updated in relation to this issue. Thank you and I thank the Minister for her answer. Does the Minister agree with me that staff shortages in special schools is an urgent matter and that those shortages are affecting the ability of classes to run which has a negative impact on our children, young people and their families? And can the Minister outline how our department is ensuring that there is enough professional, fully qualified, skilled and experienced staff available to fill positions in special schools? I thank the, the member for her question and, and I absolutely agree with what she has said with regards to special schools and it is a priority to ensure that those schools are um, resourced appropriately. My officials are working very closely alongside EA in order to address that and as I've indicated in the um, original question that we have been working through the emergency resourcing team and also special school support officers in order to give particular um, support to some schools which are finding it much more difficult than others to, to manage. Um, I am cognizant of that there are a number of schools who have had class closures and have had to close um, for particular days in order to address that. That does concern me because I don't want any people to, to miss out on learning, but I'm also very aware of the pressures that this places on families too. Um, so I, I'd like to give the, the member my assurance that uh, my officials are, are working in order to address um, the, the difficulties that we currently have. I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Can I ask the Minister, is she aware of the particular pressures facing Arvely Special School in my constituency in West Tyrone? And um, can she outline what she's doing to ensure that the school can remain open safely and provide the services, the wide range of services that are needed for um, the children that attend that school, please? I do thank the member for her um, question. And I am aware that Arvely did have a particular issue before the Halloween break where they closed for two days, and that was really to allow a 12-day um, window in order for, for, for both um, teachers and for um, young people to be able to return to school. Um, as I said in previous um, answers, I am aware of the challenges that are being presented in special schools particularly. Um, and as I said, the EEA are working very closely in order to address some of those issues. Um, if there's anything else in particular with regards to Arvely, I'm quite happy to, to speak to the member. But I, having visited the school and, and the service that they provide in that particular area, I know that it's a resource that we don't want to see closed at any point. Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the Minister for the answer to the question so far. Uh, Minister, can you provide an update on the impact COVID infections is having on teaching and non-teaching staff in special schools? Have you an exact number uh, for the number of teachers that are at present? Um, and I thank the, um, the member for his question. I actually do have that information at hand. Um, so, with regards to the week beginning the, the 1st of November, four schools had class closures, and the week beginning the 8th of November, seven schools had class closures and one full school site closure. Um, with regards to the particular numbers, the number of teachers absent on the week beginning the 1st of November, there were 91. 
Um, on the week beginning the 8th of November, there were 111. With regards to classroom assistance, the week beginning the 1st of November, there were 239. And the week beginning the 8th of November, there were 298. Oh, Stephen Dunn. Mr Speaker, I appreciate the answers given so far on this important issue and the answers to me in correspondence from the Minister in relation to Clifton School in Bangor. I think we appreciate the very real challenges facing the special schools sector at this time. Can I ask the Minister what other avenues are the Department and the EA exploring to address the staffing challenges throughout the system? I thank the member for his question. Um, as he did reference, the EA Emergency Resourcing Team has supported the establishment of a number of relief registers across a range of non-teaching roles. Officials continue to work closely with the chair of the Special School Leadership Group to provide support in response to the staffing challenges faced by special schools. The child care course placement coordinators in the five regional FE colleges have been contacted and advised that special schools may be in a position to host placement students with an interest in working with pupils with complex needs and they have been asked to contact their local school directly to explore if this is an option. Colleges have also been provided with information about the Classroom Assistance Emergency Register and asked to bring it to the attention of students who may be qualified or available for casual work. The placement coordinators have circulated this information to um, their colleagues on all campuses. And I am aware that there have been issues with Access NI in the past, and they have now recently confirmed that there are no delays in processing vetting checks and that the education sector is being prioritised for a quick turnaround. Call Roy Beggs. Question number two. The pilot programme targeted additional teacher support project for post-primary children with complex interaction of needs implemented by the Education Authority is based on the reallocation of classroom assistant hours to provide newly qualified teachers uh, hours to support children with statements of SEN. The Education and Training Inspectorate report on the initial pilot, which took place in March 2020, found that there was very positive collaborative work work and practice with skill differentiation, good relationships amongst staff and pupils, and pupils demonstrated a positive attitude towards engagement with learning. A further pilot has been rolled out and is being evaluated in terms of tracking pupil progression against academic, social and emotional indicators, staff structure and management processes. Following the 2021 PAC recommendations, the Department has begun the procurement for an independent review of the EEA Special Educational Needs Services, which includes an assessment of the impact of adult assistance on children's outcomes. The report of the independent review is due in the summer of 2022. The EEA has decided to pause expansion of the pilot until it receives and considers the independent review report. Roy Beggs, supplementary. Thank the Minister for answer so far. Um, but in some post-primary schools, uh, there can be three, four, or even five classroom assistants standing at the back of the classroom, awaiting to intervene should the need arise. EA officials, EA board members, and indeed the permanent secretary have all acknowledged that this is not a good, way, a good use of public funds. So my question is, when will all principals be given flexibility with their SEN funding so that they can apply additional SEN teachers and classroom assistance for one-to-one -one learning and for small group work, and so improve the educational outcome from, for pupils uh, with special educational needs. And, and I thank the, the member for his um, question, and he, he does raise a very interesting point that obviously does need addressed. Um, and certainly, as you're aware, there are a number of reviews, um, and obviously the recommendations which have come through from the number of reports, which hopefully will then start to address some of those issues and making sure that the need is targeted and targeted appropriately to those who need it. Call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is anti-bullying week, uh, the theme for which is one kind word. So can I, I offer a kind word of compliment to the Education Minister on her odd socks that she's supported to, supporting today in uh, support of anti-bullying week? Can I, I also then ask the Education Minister just how far over capacity and under-resourced our SEN provision is and who is accountable uh, for responding to that matter? 
Well, I, th I thank the member for his question, uh, and obviously I've, I've seen um, the member socks as well. He, he displayed them in the canteen earlier. Um, Look, there is a, there's a growing need within SEN, as we all very much appreciated, and there is an issue in relation to how it's resourced, and that in itself is a challenge for us. Um, I would be hopeful that, the, as, I've, I've, as I've indicated, the number of reviews that are being carried out and the seriousness with within, within which my department and, and EA are taking um, SEN, that this will then meet, lead to a much more focused outcome um, in order to address the, the, the need um, for special educational needs. I'll pass you in. I've got a Kion Corla. Uh, Minister of the Finance, Minister recently announced a significant funding boost for special educational needs in the October monitoring round. Could the Minister give us some further detail on how that uh, money will be allocated and when we can expect to see special supports reach our uh, classrooms and schools? I thank the member for his question. And obviously, October monitoring round itself was a challenge. Um, my department did support uh, special educational needs beds, totalling in excess of £23 million. Um, of that, £7.7 .7 million was secured, which leaves a residual pressure of £15.9 million, which isn't insignificant. Um, the funding um, was secured was for £4.6 million for EA block grant pressures, combined with additional COVID funding, totalling £3.1 million. And that was for PPE for special schools, £0.4 million. Pounds. Special schools substitute um, teaching staff and other staff cover of £0.5 million. Pounds. Additional SEND pupil support services of £1.2 million. And asymptomatic testing in special schools of £1 million. Pounds. Meeting the needs of um, SEND pupils with a statement of need is a statutory requirement for us, and obviously um, work will continue on. Um, and so um, each child will actually have some support. However, there are consequences on other aspects of what we deliver if, if we continue to, with the burden of that. The Finance Minister has given an assurance that he will give priority the SEND pressures at the January monitoring. Um, and that's, of, of course, dependent upon whether funding is available. However, given the significant level of pressures, as I've indicated, um, it's imperative that EA takes actions also to manage pressures in order to avoid an, an, over, uh, an overspend situation at the end of the year. I'm going to continue to make the case, um, honestly and importantly, for the funding of special educational needs at every opportunity. Um, and I would hope that um, I will receive the necessary um, support from other parties in the executive in relation to that. But with regards to when we will see that um, being spent, those, those, that spend will be immediate. I'll just make an Minister, you'll be aware of the educational trauma experienced by children and young people awaiting a statement, awaiting support, and the ripple effect that has cutting through their family, not just their family, cutting through their community, and the impacts that has on them later on in life. Can you give us an update on the current waiting list for special education needs assessments and supports? And can you update us what conversations you're having with the Health Minister around tackling waiting lists? Thank you. Thank the member for his question um, in relation to um, the statements and uh, the need for to, to move these on quickly. The um, EA has reported that the proportion of statements being completed within 26 weeks each month has fallen. Um, from 96%, that's one out of 161 out of 168 statements in April 2021, to 73%, that's 382 out of 525 statements in September. Um, this has been as a direct result of a significant spike in the number of referrals received across May and June 2021, which is more than double the number received in the same period of 2020. And although that spike has since fallen away to a degree, referral numbers are still significantly higher across the subsequent months compared to 2020. And in response to these pressures, um, the EA has already acceler accelerated the expansion of staff resource, which has been planned for early 2022 to prepare, prepare for the SEND Act implementation and that recruitment process is underway. Um, which I hope will assist in restoring the 26-week time frame compliance. But I, I absolutely agree with the member with regards to the pressures that this puts on families. Can I call Doug Beattie? Question three, please. 
Development Proposal DP 574, which proposes that Craigavon Senior High School will operate on a single site at 26 to 34 Lurgan Road, Portadown, with effect from the 1st of September 2022, or as soon as possible thereafter, was published by the Education Authority on the 22nd of April 2021. The statutory objection period ended on the 22nd of June 2021. A submission containing all pertinent information on the proposal will be presented to me for my decision in due course, and I can assure you that I will not unduly delay my decision as soon as the proposal is presented to me for consideration. Supplementary, Doug uh, Thank you, Minister. I mean, this has been going on for over five years now, given our slight interlude uh, for a short period in between, um, and it's having a detrimental effect uh, on. Uh, the community and on the, on the pupils. Uh, parents don't want their kids bust out of Lurgan just because they were not selected for grammar education. Uh, neither do businesses, neither do sporting clubs, neither does the local council, uh, neither does uh, educational experts who think busting them out of Lurgan because they were not selected for a grammar education. Could I ask the Minister to please listen to the people in Lurgan who says it is not a good idea to bust these children out of Lurgan to port it down and it will not help their education. And I, and I thank the member for his question and as he will, he will understand, I can't comment in relation to what he has said. However, all um, information and all arguments which have been given to um, officials with regards to this will be collated and um, presented to me um, in, a, in a decision in, in the coming weeks. Um, so at this stage, it would be unfair for me to, to make comment with regards to what he said. But I, I, I want to reassure the member that all comments will be taken into consideration. Kelly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As uh, one of the parties who supported uh, the retention uh, uh, in Lurgan, um, can I ask, uh, Minister, and you have heard your remarks in response to Mr. Beatty about not being able to comment, but there was a proposal put forward where Lurgan Junior High School campus, campus would, would allow the sharing of accommodation in the absence of any agreed way forward around academic selection. I'm just urging you to consider uh, and to meet with the, the principal and the Board of Governors of Lurgan Junior High School in relation to their proposal about providing an alternative site. And I thank the, the member for um, her question. And maybe it is quite timely that I am meeting with representatives of Lurgan Junior High tomorrow. I'm going to call Diane Dodds. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know that the minister is very aware of the problems uh, with the school estate uh, on the Lurgan campus uh, of the senior high school. Will the minister confirm that the overwhelming majority of those who responded uh, to the development pr proposal uh, rejected uh, the, the basis uh, that, it is now, uh, that it is now based upon? And will uh, she confirm what other proposals were actually considered in this issue? And I thank the, the member for a question. Unfortunately, I'm not in a position to confirm the numbers of responses and, and whether or not they were positive or negative with regards to um, the, the DP at this particular stage because I haven't received the information from my officials in regards to it. Um, the, the latter part of her question was in regards to what the other options were. Um, the case for change for DP 574 sets out the four specific options which were considered. Um, as well as an investigation into a number of suitable sites in the area. So the first option was the proposed relocation of the Craig Alvin Senior High School campus to the Lurgan Junior High site with a, with a new build of 250 pupils post-primary. Um, option two was Craig Alvin Senior High School operating on a single site on the Portadown campus, um, which was the preferred option. The, th the third option was the extension of the Lurgan campus following the relocation of the Southern Regional College in Lurgan. And the fourth option was um, Lurgan Junior High School operating as 11 to 16 school, with the option to transfer to um, grammar provision at um, 14. Thank you. I call Andrew Muir. Speaker, my question should have been asked. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I move on. Patty McGlone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number four. Teachers in Northern Ireland received a 2% cost of living increase in 2018, 2019, and 2020. 
In addition, staff that were eligible for incremental progression will have progressed up the teacher's pay scale at an estimated cost of 0.8% per year. The vast majority of non-teaching staff in Northern Ireland receive the National Joint Council pay award each year. The headline NJC cost of living increase was 2% in both 2018 and 2019, although higher rewards were made to staff on the lowest pay points. The NJC agreement for 2020 was 2.75%. Non-teaching staff eligible for incremental progression will also have progressed on their pay scale at an estimated cost of 0.5% per year. Both the teaching and non-teaching pay awards for 2021 have yet to be agreed. I, I thank Patrick Sloan, Supplementary. Okay. Maleska, can call you. Thank, thank you. And I thank the Minister for her detail there. Um, specifically, in regard to the role that teachers and indeed other ancillary support staff have played right throughout and have visited schools, uh, about eight schools over this last uh, three to four weeks, and I see the complete dedication that is, is shining through from classroom assistants to principal to, to other teaching staff. Um, is it not within the realms of the department to give those people what they required, a decent pay rise? I know some of those have been more or less uh, a pay rise here and a pay rise there, but something which is compatible at least with the cost of living and something that recognises that dedication, that worth that they have put in both while the schools were open and while they weren't open, because that dedication shone right through as I visited those schools in the last three to four weeks. And, and I thank the, the member for his question and also for his commentary in relation to the dedication of teachers and support staff. And I absolutely agree with every word that he has said with regards to that. And as you know, I would visit maybe that number of schools every, every week. Um, and I have made it sort of a priority to get out to see and to speak to teachers and to classroom assistants. And I do see their dedication. Um, so I do, and that's, I put that on the record, that I do appreciate that. Um, however, there are a number of factors which obviously um, impact and influence the pay awards of staff, as, as you'll be aware. And obviously, the, the pay award for the Northern Ireland teaching staff needs to follow the Northern Ireland pay policy guidance set out by the executive. And this obviously is um, noting and taking into consideration the constrained budget position in Northern Ireland and obviously the, the pressures that there are on public services. Um, and this also advises that pay awards need to be affordable in the context of department's budget allocation. Uh, the latest um, pay policy guidance notes that pay awards for up to 1% are allowable, subject to there being a commitment to reform and obviously efficiency initiatives. With regards to non-teaching staff, the vast majority um, are contractually entitled to the National NJC Pay Award and that's agreed by the National Employers for Local Government Services. And the Northern Ireland officials actually don't have any input with regards to the negotiation process or the fi final settlement with regard to that. But that doesn't take away from the fact that um, these people have worked incredibly hard through very, very challenging times. Well, Patrick Delargy. Gormaga, can call you. Um, Minister, I've met with a number of classroom assistants from across my constituency over the last number of weeks. The consensus among all of them, there was real concern about their pay and about their working conditions. I know myself from a lot of classroom assistants who I've worked with that it is difficult to retain these brilliant and really skilled people. So I wonder, could you outline in detail for me what provision you're putting in place to try and retain classroom assistants on our schools? And again, I, I agree with the, the sentiments of, of, the, um, of the member with regards to the work that they do and that they are exceptional in the assistance that they give um, and also the, the sort of the longer term impact that they will have on the children that they work very, very closely with on a day to day basis and that's to be commended. Um, as I indicated to the, the, the previous member with regards to non-teaching staff, um, they're contractually entitled to the NJC um, pay award. Um, which is um, not something which my officials um, are involved with the nego negotiation of. Um, there, there, has, there are ongoing um, negotiations with regards to a final offer, which was obviously made in, in, in July 2021. Um, however, what we can do, and, and obviously I would be supportive of if there were to be a review in relation to um, grading, um, but that would be very much dependent on, on need and justification and also needs then to be taken into consideration again with the, the Northern Ireland Executive um, pay policy guidance. Harry Harvey. 
you <coughs> very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the uh, Minister for answers thus far. Minister, in terms of the education budget for next year, could you outline what pressures are and if the Department mm -hmm. gets its baseline again, what will mean to education in Northern Ireland? Thank okay. you. I thank the member for his question and an, an indicative 2022-23 baseline um, of two, um, two billion two hundred and sixty nine million point point six million has been provided to my department by the Department of Finance for planning purposes. If the position does not change at draft or final budget stage, this baseline will represent a four percent cut to the 21-22 education resource budget and before taking account of other inescapable or pre-committed pressures, which are estimated to be in excess of £350 million for next year. And that's inclusive of the £84 million shortfall in the indicative baseline. These pressures cover a wide range of education priorities, but relate largely to school-based pressures such as teaching and non-teaching pay and special educational needs, as well as EA block grant pressures and maintaining those programmes previously. Um, supported through confidence and supply funding such as Sure Start and Early Years Pathway Fund. Without significant additional funding, the budget position for the Department of Education is likely to continue to be extremely challenging and some very difficult decisions will have to be made which could have serious consequences for frontline services in education which will obviously then result in detrimental impact on the futures of our children and our young people. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, um, I just wanted to ask you then, uh, whenever teachers are going through their pay reviews um, and they're being, going through their, their assessments to see how they're behaving um, within their job, it doesn't matter how well then that they um, perform, um, it seems to be that there will be no pay reward unless there's additional money. Can you assure young teachers that there is actually a career pathway for them that they can develop through, given the fact that you're now saying that it all will depend on how much money education will get if they can ever get a pay increase? And I do thank the, the member for her question. And she will understand that um, during the action short of strike, as a consequence of that, um, there was an agreement um, with the unions that we would um, undertake um, a workforce review project. Um, and that was to deliver nine reviews um, within the teachers' pay and workload agreement, and that in itself is progressing well. So there's a number of pieces of work which are following through on that. But I do want to, um, I mean, I, as a former teacher, I'm, I'm more than aware of the commitment that is, that is required um, and the, the long hours that teachers put in in order to um, have positive outcomes for all of our young people. And I am committed to supporting them um, in any way that I possibly can. But we are obviously cognizant of the fact that we are in very serious and difficult times with regards to our budget. And all of these things do have to be taken into consideration. But I would want to be positive that you know, teaching is a career um, and that we want people to enter and to um, be committed to and to enjoy and to feel supported. Call McGuigan and the member may not get a supplementary. Gara Melgood, I can call your case ever a Coeig. Question five. My department engages with the Department for Infrastructure and the Public Health Agency on the Active Schools Travel Programme. Um, this is an initi initiative funded by the Department for Infrastructure and the Public Health Agency and delivered by the charity Sustrans and their officers work to equip children with the necessary skills to enable them to walk or cycle safely. The overall objective of the programme is to increase the number of school pupils who walk, cycle or scoot to school. My department is currently supporting DFI in a programme to allow the installation of cycle shelters in schools and providing a secure storage facility and improving the infrastructure within the school grounds. It's hoped that we will be able to encourage an increased number of children cycling. DFI is providing the funding for this scheme. My department also offers opportunities through the curriculum for teachers to cover the issue of road safety. For example, at primary level, the personal development and mutual understanding area of learning requires teachers to enable pupils to develop knowledge, understanding and skills in keeping themselves healthy and safe. At post-primary level, the learning for life and work area of learning requires that pupils should have opportunities to develop preventative strategies in relation to accidents in the home, school and on the road. And that ends the period for a list of questions, members, and we move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. Topical question three has been withdrawn, and I call Anya Murphy. Gurami Yogurt, question one. 
apologies. Minister, I'd like to thank you for your answers thus far. Um, our young people are under more pressure as they try and prepare for the GCSEs and A-levels after two years of interrupted learning. I have been contacted by a number of students in Fermanagh, as well as parents, who are greatly concerned about their exams and the huge level of content, content that they have to catch up on. Can the Minister outline how these young people will be supported through what is a hugely stressful time? Um, I, I do thank the, the member for her question, and I absolutely understand where she's coming from with regards to that. Um, priority um, for me has been that we do return to examinations um, this academic year because I think it's the best thing for our young people um, in order for them to be assessed fairly with regards to the work that they do. Um, she will be um, obviously aware that due to the disruption um, to learning over the last um, two academic years that mitigations have been put in place in order for the assessment of CAs, GCSEs, ASs and A-level um, qualifications and we were very early um, in our announcement around what that would look like compared to the other regions. We made an announcement um, with regards to that on the 17th of May. Um, for the majority of CAs, um, GCSEs, um, ASs and A-level qualifications, one unit of assessment was omitted and this would then reduce the number of exams that um, young people and candidates would then have to be required to take. In addition to this, um, SIA has also provided exam um, aids for GCSE maths um, and they were made available to schools early in September. Um, but I am very mindful of the fact that um, our A-level um, students, for example, will not have sat any public examinations and obviously assistance is required in order to give them a reassurance and confidence to go into exams. So, uh, Minister, I'd like to thank you for your, for your answer. Um, schools continue to report a number of COVID-related absences, which obviously adds then, to the disruption caused by the pandemic. Can you outline what support your department can make available to schools to assist young people in keeping up with the demands of their course despite this ongoing disruption? I thank the member for her questions. As I outlined, I suppose in my initial response, that mitigations have been put in place with regards to reduction in um, the number of units that um, pupils will have to take. We are very, we are very mindful of the fact that COVID is still with us, and um, and while we don't want to be in a, sta a stage where we put in so many mitigations that the qualifications then become meaningless, um, that all of these things will have to be taken into consideration as we as we move forward to the examination in in May. Um, she'll also be aware that I. Did did commit um, to um, engage maths programme um, in September where I allocated £545,000 um, which was targeted directly at those, those going through GCSEs, um, GCSE maths um, starting obviously in, in November. Um, so we are keeping all of this under um, review. However, she will be aware that, again, as I've said earlier, that the mitigations that we do have in place here from, um, on behalf of SIA are much greater than those that are in place in English and Wales, England and Wales. Did the Department do enough to encourage the celebration of the Northern Ireland centenary in our schools? Um, I, th I thank the, the member for his question in relation to that. Um, there are a number of programmes which have been announced earlier in the year, um, including um, Northern Ireland Centenary Art Competition, which will be closing in the next um, couple of weeks. We have time capsules, um, we have um, a digital programme uh, and, and other resources which are being made available um, through the CA website. Um, alongside that, the member will obviously be aware that there's also the centenary tree planting, um, which um, has been facilitated uh, by the NIO, and which I've had the privilege of being able to attend a number of schools in order um, to plant those trees. Supplementary, Jim Allister. Why was no memento of this momentous occasion of the centenary offered to pupils uh, through schools that wanted it? And was there any curriculum coverage? of the centenary. And again, I thank the member for his question. And um, there are a number of resources which are actually on the SEA website and on a hub, um, which schools can access. Um, and we have um, set aside further monies in order for to have various celebrations, which of course schools have taken up. Um, again, I'll go I can go back to, to review as to whether or not a that was actually considered at the time. Um, but the member will also know that there are still 
while there's, there's still only a number of weeks left, there's still some initiatives which, is, which are ongoing um, until the end of the year. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, la last week you announced that you intend to bring through new legislation to give parents more flexibility in terms of when children um, start their education. Can you give us some more details on that uh, around timescales and steps in the process? I thank the member for her question and um, she'll be aware that um, this has been a priority for me. Um, I was actually very supportive of the concept when it was being brought forward by, um, by John O'Dowd um, during his tenure as minister and I'm delighted that we do have the public consultation on the deferral of school starting age um, which began last week on the 9th of November and it will close on Tuesday the 4th of January. And I'll then bring forward a final policy decision and seek executive approval in order to bring forward um, legislation. I do remain optimistic that with the agreement of the committee um, that legislation can be um, quickly taken through the Assembly um, to make this much needed change. Uh, I'm delighted to have launched the eight-week consultation um, uh, in last week um, and it has been received um, fairly positively to date. Um, within that, children born in April, May and June are currently the youngest in the school class. Um, we have excellent schools and a very well regarded play-based curriculum in the early years of primary school. Um, the vast majority of children, regardless of their age within their class, do thrive at primary school. However, there are some parents who feel that starting school shortly after their fourth birthday isn't right for their very young child and they've concerns particularly around issues such as social skills, emotional readiness, the longer school day and independence in um, personal care. Um, but, so that is really the, 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 the main body of what we are consulting on as an option. Um, so we are proposing that that's flexibility with regards to um, starting, the school starting age will be available um, on parental request to any child born between the 1st of April and the 1st of July, um, and this doesn't need to have an educational assessment. Paula Bradley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. As someone who was born in the last week in June, I understand all too well um, how much that uh, can affect you as being the youngest person in your class the whole way through school. Uh, member, or Minister, it's good to know that you want to get this uh, passed through before the end of this mandate. Could I just ask that you could highlight again just how parents can get involved uh, before the consultation closes? Um, thank you, Member, for a question. I would encourage everyone to get involved, and the easiest way for them to do that is by completing um, the online questionnaire, um, which obviously accompanies the, the consultation document. Um, this is available from my department's website and also from NI Direct. Um, officials will also be organising a number of engagement events with parents and young people and other stakeholders, um, and I would advise them to look out for further details with regards to that. I call Aisling Riley. The recent COP26 event has demonstrated just how immediate the climate crisis is and how urgent action is required to reverse the trajectory we are on. Young people have the most at stake in terms of the climate crisis and it is they who are leading the charge in terms of saving the planet. So can I ask the Minister if she plans to make education on climate change a core part of, of its curriculum? Um, and I thank the, um, the member for her question, and it is obviously very timely given COP26 last week. Um, the the um, education does um, play a critical role in re regards to mitigating climate change. Um, and obviously there are a number of aspects of the curriculum which are already addressing this, particularly with the world around us at primary level and environment and society at, at post-primary. Um, and I suppose really what we need to do is to ensure that our young people are investigating and exploring um, what the impacts of um, the environment and, and climate change. Um, we want them to have a greater understanding of the interdependence of society and the economy and the environment um, in order to... Um, to be able to respect what we, what we currently have. Um, I know, the, obviously, the, the executive itself is very much committed um, to tackling climate change through the commitments of NDNA. Um, and obviously, I'll be supportive of um, those commitments um, and how we can then review within education the best ways of being able to work through that. Supplementary, Aisling Riley. Gormila does the minister agree with me that, given the urgency of the crisis facing us, that we should equip our young people from an early age with the knowledge and skills to make a positive impact on reducing the climate crisis, and that incorporating it into the curriculum would be a good start? 
Well, and I thank the member for a question. And, and I suppose when, if she, she's out and about in school, she will see that um, our young people are very much engaged with the environment um, and certainly involved in action against plastics and so on. And they're probably much more engaged than we would ever have been whenever we were at school. Um, and there is an ethos now in a, in a number of schools, particularly around primary schools. Uh, last week on, on visits, I, I met in uh, post-primary schools too, where um, schools councils are taking up various opportunities in order to try to address what so that is currently within our schools. Um, I'm certainly um, content to review any um, further educational aspects that we need to do in order to enhance and to support them through that. Well, Keeve Archibald. Can I ask the Minister, the Finance Minister recently announced a capital funding boost for education of about £20 million. Can I ask the Minister when she intends to announce the next round of major capital works? I thank the member for a question. Uh, and obviously, whatever amount the, um, the finance minister announces with regards to capital will never be enough in order to address the issues that we do currently have within the, um, the school estate. Um, it would be my intention to announce a further capital um, um, round towards the end of this financial year. Okay, Archibald, so and I thank the Minister for that response. Um, I wrote to the Minister at the beginning of July in relation to St Patrick's College in Dungiven and invited the Minister to visit the school because despite the be best efforts of their really committed staff, they are struggling to maintain the school to the standard they'd like and the, the patchy nature of um, small repairs here and there is no longer really enough. So the young people of this school deserve the, the same facilities, the same good facilities than any other. Can I ask the Minister if she would commit to visiting the school to see firsthand what's needed? Absolutely. Uh, Christopher Stover is not in this place, and I call Keith Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, the Minister, so far for answers. Minister, um, can you give the House an update on the actions you're taking in relation to a fair start, the report on educational underachievement, please? I thank the member for his question. Obviously, a fair start report um, it was, was compiled by the expert panel on educational underachievement, which is a commitment by NDNA, um, was launched in the beginning of June this year. Um, the report identifies eight key areas and 47 actions spread across six years. I'm really keen to see this progressed um, on this, um, which is an incredibly important um, programme. So I do have um, four million pounds set aside for this year's budget to begin the work. 22 of the 47 actions have been initiated, and that's 40% of the actions within five months of the plan being published, and an additional seven are being progressed. Um, the investment will initiate fundamental change in early years, including enhancing the Getting Ready suite of programmes, a review with health colleagues of the role of health professionals in Sure Start, and taking forward additional nurture provision. My department will continue to prioritise the provision of digital devices to learners who need them and will commission a review of alternative deprivation measures um, for free school meal entitlement. Time will be needed within the department to secure um, staffing resource to support the delivery of the action plan. Uh, and the member would perhaps would also like to note that I have met with a number of executive colleagues as this is a cross-departmental um, commitment. Supplementary, keep your cannon. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, so far. Minister, um, you referred to the money for this year's budget. Considering it's a new decade, new approach, uh, priority, have you got commitment that it's going to happen next year and you've got the budget for it? Um, well, I I'd certainly hope that we can get the money for it for next year. However, obviously, given the constraints that we have, there will be, there will be, other, there will be pressures. Um, I am conscious that this is a very ambitious and important programme. I'm committed to its delivery, hence why I have met with other ministers to ensure that they obviously see the value of this. That, that includes um, health, um, TEO and, and communities. Um, so we have to see that obviously this is taken in the context of, of other pressures and, and I referred to those earlier in, in question time. From a budget perspective, ideally it would be best to wait the draft um, budget proposal before a firm decision can be made, um, but certainly I will be making the case for a fair start. Members, time is up and members please take your ease before we move to the next item.